Duncan, um, I've been doing IDT events. Oh, I founded the company in '92. We started with um, hardcore, the Thunderdome period. Then, 13 years ago, the Sensation we founded, and started with trend stuff, club stuff. We did restaurants, bars, restaurants, radio stations, and then I think about seven years ago, yeah, the whole world was changing into an international feeling so we did sensation started in 10 countries 20 countries funny wise uh, five years ago I wrote on a note if I would had money how would I do it and I wrote a small plan to my right hand from a holiday and it was inspired on the story of SFX of uh, a Bob Silliman story with the old SFX and then a year ago uh, Shelley called me uh, hi, this is Shelley. Uh, I would like to meet you and let's talk. And I was, well, what about? And then he explained me the story and I was, whoa, maybe I thought about it, but we weren't ready at all yet, a year ago. Then we, uh, we lived in the US for a year. We did the sensation stuff, which was really amazing. We did a deal with SFX and then we started to know them. And it felt very well and really good. And we decided, let's go for it and let's join this big new company. In 1968, I went up to the Boston Garden and a fellow says, what do you want to do here? I said, I want to rent it and put a show on. And he said, who do you want to bring in? I said, Jimi Hendrix. He says, never heard of him. I said, he'll do well. And of course he did well, sold out. Sold out. So now in 2010, I'm in Los Angeles, and I'm at lunch with some people, and the fellow next to me said, you know, I manage Dead Mouse. And I said, who's that? That was my first introduction to, we don't call it EDM at our company, we call it EMC, which is electronic music culture. Because we feel it's more than just dance music, it's a culture that's happening and it's going way further than just um, concerts. So the fellow said to me, we're playing tonight at Electric Daisy. You want to come? I said, sure, I'd love to go to this club. Little did I know this club was at the LA Coliseum and it was 85,000 people. And it was my first um, indoctrination into it. And I got to meet Pasquale who runs Electric Daisy, and he took me around. And I said, Pasquale, am I the oldest person here? And he said, how old are you? And I told him. He says, oh no, my parents are here. And that made me feel great. So then I decided this was an industry that should be consolidated in certain areas, and I was looking to find who I believed were the best in the industry, and of course, that led me to Duncan, and um, he's, it's been great, but it was very hard to get him to do it, and that since he's done, um, worked with us and then expanded that, um, it's been nothing but great, and we're continuing to bring his great events all over the world where they haven't been seen before and where they wouldn't have been if it wasn't the two of us working together. I feel also now this industry, um, yeah, it, it is consolidating. If you look at the, uh, at the DJs, joining all the big agents, for me that was a big point. Uh, that the conversation we had as a promoter, well, I don't like the word promoter, creator, um, to agents, it was changing our industry, I think. The, the fees of the DJs soaring through the roof um, I think it's time for us then as creators and promoters to join and build this professional company. And I think guys like us who like to create events, in the, in the long run, that's what we like to do. We need help in the back end to create this a real company. For me also, is a concern was, of course, which I heard was to be that in the, how are we going to keep that independency feeling comparison to being a stock exchange 
dollar yeah, on the Nasdaq. Yeah. How are we gonna? For me, sometimes people ask me. Sure. I don't feel it that way. I feel it as I want to create good stuff, and we need we need money. Um, the Tomorrow World in, in in the US, I think we put it's nearly twenty million to put on. We didn't have that kind of money. We don't have it. And then I p we put the plan on the table to Shelley, Bob, and Mitch, and they went, "That's nice. Let's do it." One of the things that I know I'm good at is knowing what I don't know. And I know I'm not going to be the creator of the events. I'm not going to be the one who disseminates it, creates the experience. And I look at a Duncan as my mentor in that part. And I don't want to interfere with what makes him great. I just want to be there to enable him to do it bigger and better than he's ever done it before. The thing that is of interest is business is going to go on. It's going to go on no matter what. Las Vegas has four components of income. So they can pay numbers that no one's going to pay. What I believe is important is that the artists don't price what Vegas prices are to other places because the average producer of a show does not have income from a hotel, does not have income from a casino, and sometimes does not have the income from food and beverage. And if they do, they only have a part of it. Uh, how was that comparison to the rock and roll then? Eh? When it's well, it was a little different because at that time you had 30 key promoters in the U.S. and each one had an area and they built an artist. The artist came back to them, came back to them. And it's quite different in this, where you're building a festival or you're building a certain j venue, and the artist um, plays there, and most everyone sells out. Uh, have you made any other acquisitions or anything else you can tell us of? Very uh, exciting in the pipeline. Um, I can't tell you, but we have. We've made several that will be announced over the next couple of weeks. And there are many around the world that we're in um, very strong discussions with. What we want to do is develop a network worldwide that any new event, any new artist could be put into it and know that they'll be get the proper exposure, treated properly, and handled properly any market in the world. Uh, Duncan, when wa what was your biggest challenge when you uh, uh, be be transformed from uh, your events from raves uh, as they started to a professional experience pro entertainment product? And when did it happen? What was the turning point that realized that now this is the next level? I think the decision to go to a football stadium, the first sensation, that was 13 years ago. But when we did the stadium, we knew it was an ugly football stadium. I mean, you can't say I'm going to the football stadium and thinking, oh, that's going to be a nice party. So when we sat down and we really went, okay, how are we going to create something special? We created a nice atmosphere. So when you walked into the football stadium, uh, I think that was the beginning of bringing entertainment to the events and a good feeling. And, and, and because of sensation started a bit in that way, the festivals also started a bit to change into more people. They want to serve, they, at that point in Holland especially, well, that was the turning point. The turning point was to do a football stadium, you have to give a high level of production. It's a high level of, 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 of entertainment and on a very professional level of Everything has to be perfect. You can't, you can't be in a football stadium, have a production of three million and being shitty. It had to be professional at that point. So we took the best rock festival as our benchmark and we wanted to be better or creative or more, and, and all levels. So and also on, on the service level, people don't wait anymore in our events. They, if you go to the bar, you get your drink. Even if there's 60,000 people, you get your drink. Um, Shelly, I was wondering, what are the two line items of sensation that really motivated you to invest in SFX? I had the good fortune of seeing it, experiencing it, being there, knowing what it's like, seeing it come to the Barclay Center in Brooklyn a year ago, and um, understanding what 
these people were doing and where they could go with it. And as Duncan and I spoke and he educated me on it, aside from chasing him to Ibiza, I went back to Amsterdam several times, hung out with him in New York several times, and got to really understand what his goals were. What does he want to do with his um, company? Where does he want to see it in two years, three years, five years? And how can I help him attain that? Okay. What I looked at was this was a key brand to work with. This was a key brand. I wasn't interested initially what it would return. But if we were the ones working with them or having sensation in our company, this would bring us to another level as opposed to being a purchaser of a small festival that didn't do much business and that we could grow. And as a result of it, other companies are coming to us. They gave us credibility. I wanted to work with the best from the beginning and I was able to accomplish that. The most funny part was for me, uh, we've been a company now for 21 years and we had some financial people and some important financial people, and they always said, where's the business plan, and where the f where's the, uh, the, the forecasts, and, and then I met these guys, and for me, the most funny part of the whole deal was, and then I came back to the office, and then, and how's the business plan, and the returns, and, and the stock exchange, and I said, there is no plan. I said, what you? everybody went to me, there is no plan, there is no, Bob, the guys are just doing it, and I, for me, that was one of the things the most most important to join it because I'm exactly the same. I think all the people who are joining now and, and, and are at that table are cool people, people to hang out with. And it's funny, it's different cultures, but in one way we are the same, that's the entrepreneurial feeling of trying to create something. You're like the Warren Buffett of the event industry. It's like you're Tetrising all the the big companies around the world and finance them to go bigger? Or how should I look at it at the, at the concept of, of SFX, the future development? Um, Duncan's right. A lot of it we don't know. It's happening as we're going. What we do know is that there's a lot of artists and new festivals and new events that won't see the light of day if there isn't someone out there who will bring it to the people. And that's one of the things we want to accomplish. And the image of big business, I think in order to have everyone accomplish this, it has to be financed. But I don't feel like I'm big business. I don't wear jeans just here. This is my attire every day at the office. I come in when I need to, I finish two, three in the morning when it is. And it's just something I enjoy getting up every day doing. And many of the um, companies we have um, worked with and acquired, I do consider my friends, especially Duncan, but many others. And they call it home all hours of the night. It's not, OK, at 6 o'clock, I'm leaving the office. Don't call me. I'll speak to you tomorrow. I don't think we could accomplish what we want to um, with that type of attitude. It's a question for both of you, really. Um, there's been a lot of talk in the mainstream media about the bubble and it being close to being burst and so on. As we learned in our panels this morning, in fact, the real boom begins now, and we have a whole new audience watching this music space. How does your relationship play into that? And what are your plans? What is IDNT and Tomorrowland's plans to capitalize and to you know, show this industry to this new audience that's watching and where does SFX play into that with IDT and on a wider level? We just had a, a two-day session internally yesterday and the day before with just the IDT crew and if we just we are looking the list of countries which are on our, our radar it's we didn't look at them before because because we couldn't handle them but we are talking now finally to India to Japan to China, to Malaysia. To, we did a tour in Thailand. We're doing Canada next week. We're doing America. We're doing Brazil. Miss, they all want to do the festival. So we, 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 we are in a, in a luxury position to say, like the Tomorrowland guys say, we just want to do the continent. That's it, five continents. So Mr. Land is saying, let's do 10 
amazing places. And the Cuneans guys, they, they're just in two countries. They're feeling like headhunters. He was one of the DJs from that sound, was headlining EDC in New York. It's, for us, we've only just begun. It's on the wall. And it's, it's, we, we say it to ourselves every five years or three years, we're going, what's happening? And then it gets bigger and bigger. And, and I think our job is to, to maintain that when the audience walks in, they walk out with a smile. Um, I don't know where anyone sees the issue of a bubble. The promoters that I know that are in this room do very high quality events. And for everyone that I know, this year is bigger than last. And the quality of these shows, when the kid leaves, is going to dictate next year. And the music is spreading. Um, some of the companies we're speaking to have been in business 20 years, so I don't see why if it goes to new markets, that's not going to grow it for another 10, 15 years. If I saw several shows um, doing poorly, I would feel that, but every one. I mean, this past weekend, EDC was bigger than it was last year, and I don't see anything that's going to stop it. The same with every show that they're doing. I just don't see anything on the horizon that gives me uh, concern. Yeah.